You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the Footwear Industries Association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. And now your footwear insiders, Matt Priest and Andy Polk. Hey, man, how's it going? I'm doing well, man. How are you? Good, good, good. Hey, do you ever, when we go into these, do you kind of map out in your head what you're going to say? You just you go with what feels good. I just shoot from the hip, brother. Shoot from the hip. That's right. Like Brett Favre, just go out there and just throw as much as you can. <laughs> and maybe you complete 60% and you make the Hall of Fame. So some people out there are probably like, oh, his intro really stunk today. Uh, like, well, of, that's okay. It's okay. <laughs> you know, you got to be brave when you start off the show, yep. you know? Yep. So, yeah. There you <laughs> You're go. You're a brave dude. And we're done. <laughs> <laughs> um, one of the things uh, that we uh, we covered at our recent uh, business summit, our executive summit, yep. um, are really uh, shifts and changes at uh, retail with brick and mortar and online and how all that interacts with each other. People are still wrestling with that, figuring it out. I don't think it will, you know, it'll ebb and flow and keep changing. No one's going to have a golden goose on how that's going to work. And, no. And um, it's just calf. about, yeah, it, well, it's just what works for, for that company and brand and how they do that. Um, but we were honored as one of our, our keynotes that kicked off the summit was uh, the Foot Locker CEO talking about the changes they see it. And they're a really tough marketplace with sneaker resale and yeah. eBay and Amazon and all that. And, um, you know, Dick Johnson from, from Foot Locker stood up and said, you know what? We're not afraid of Amazon. No, bring it on. We have our own way of doing things, and we're going to be just fine. So um, one thing that we wanted to do was kind of take his uh, audio from uh, from the summit and actually give it to the masses. Yeah. No, I love it because you know why? Dick Johnson is um, a great executive in our industry. He was happy to come and spend time with us. In addition, Foot Locker, like, Foot Locker is this barometer, right, that it really helps us understand uh, where the industry is headed, how well the industry is doing. Because let's face it, we are a we are a sneaker nation. Uh, we at the all the way up from a, a young child all the way up to an adulthood, you are buying sneakers and Foot Locker. Every time I walk by a Foot Locker, I peek in the window before I go in to see what's hot because right. they have a dynamic stores. Sure. And uh, to so to have Dick come and be the kind of the kickoff to our event to set the tone um, was awesome. It was an honor. Yeah. And uh, and so let's let's listen in on Dick Johnson at the 2018 FDRA Footwear Executive Summit. Morning. You know, most people have to earn their stripes, and I guess Matt just did that in that uh, 15 minutes. He uh, he's certainly striper worthy for us. So thanks, Matt. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here this morning and you know this is a revolution and it's one of those things that uh, you know the end of the day it's what we all signed up for right you know it's moving faster than we ever thought it would but but this is a great time to be in this industry you know there there is a convergence of media and moments and social influence that has changed the way that our consumer sees the world so Let's talk a little bit, if we could get uh, my presentation up, we'll talk a little bit about Foot Locker and then I'll talk a little bit about we're go- where we're going on our journey. So we're a legacy retailer, right? That comes with some baggage and, and some people think that it's negative baggage that we've got over 3,000 stores around the globe. We don't see it that way. We think it's very much a positive. Kids want that interaction. Our core consumer loves to be in the stores. We have to have the right stores in the right places. We have to meet the consumer, as Matt said, at all those touch points, but it's important that we've got them. We operate in 24 countries. You know, more to open up, uh, as we've talked about, we're going to open up some countries in Asia this, uh, this fall. We've got 40,000 associates worldwide. One of the interesting things is we operate a portfolio. We've got nine different banners. You know, each of them has a web presence, social presence, etc. You know, so it becomes a very complex model for us, and that's one of the things that we work through to try to, to redefine how we speak to each of those individual customers that come into our stores and meet us in the digital spaces that we operate. You know, we have gone through a bit of a uh, significant strategic thinking you know, and mindset shift at Foot Locker. You know, if you take a look at the screen, you can see what our, our old mission statement was up in the top. You know, and it served us very well. We had a great five, six, seven-year run, 
you know, by wanting to be the leading global retailer of athletically inspired shoes and apparel. The tough word in there right now is retailer. Right? You know, what's that mean today? How do you become a retailer of the 21st century? How do you become a retailer for this generation of shoppers? You know, as we've looked at what we've been doing since 1974 when the first Foot Locker store opened up in Puente Hills, California, or since 1997 uh, when, when the Woolworth Company bought the company that I worked for at the time, East Bay, you know, what have we been doing? We've been connecting with sneaker culture and youth culture. So we've taken a bold stance, and in our future, in our mission going forward, our vision is to really inspire and empower youth culture. It's a much broader aperture because our consumer is being impacted by so many things today. It used to be sports, as Matt talked about, the backboards and the signatures and the athletes, not social icons. You know, there's a lot of people out there that have tremendous influence over this consumer. Our consumer wants immediate validation. They've got their own social followings. Our consumers believe that they're brands. We have to give them a stage to operate on. So we really do believe in relationships and engagement. And as we move forward, this ambitious new statement, mission statement, really drives that home. So as Matt talked about, you know, why are we here today? Right? You know, it's pretty simple. Everything's changed. You know, if you think about it, you know, this device just celebrated its 10th anniversary. You know, it's going on 11 years old. What a revolution it's caused. You know, there were the, the, the fortune tellers that said, oh, this is going to revolutionize things. This is going to be all of that. And they were right. You know, some of us didn't react quite quick enough. We, we moved with the consumer rather than trying to get ahead of the consumer. You know, but everything has changed how we communicate with consumers, how they want to interact with our brands, you know, the new technologies, the new platforms, the speed at which they're adopting technology. We've never seen anything like it. Transformation comes through a couple of different ways, right? It can come through evolution or it can come through revolution. I think as Matt talked about, we are in a revolution today. And it's not going to slow down. Today's customer really is almost literally born with a device in their hand. I'm not sure what a digital native means, but they are, right? By definition, they, they live their life on that device. We have to figure out how to interact with them when and how they want to be interacted with. You know, we've stopped talking about channels in our business. You know, my friend Matt Powell uses a phrase, not omni-channel, but omnipresent. You have to be where the consumer is when they want to be there. How we connect through every channel, every social app that we've got has to be consistent, has to be there to reduce friction. The brand experience can no longer just be in store, and we know that. You know, having 3,000 plus stores is not a bad thing. I don't know what the right number of stores is, but I know we have to have the right stores in the right places for our consumer. The customer journey has changed dramatically as well. You know, the buy transaction is only a one piece of this journey that we think about. You know, the discovery phase used to be like Matt. It used to be coming into the Foot Locker store to find out what was there, what was cool. You know, when launch product was going to launch, you had to know the guy that knew the guy so you knew when it was going to launch. Not anymore. The discovery and researching happens constantly with our consumer. They know more than we know sometimes. Launch dates are published in so many places, so much conflicting information that we have to try to siphon through it and make sure that our consumers know what's real in our stores. How this consumer chooses to shop and buy, that's up to them. Right? We want them to click the Buy Now button. We want them to walk into a store and buy. We want them to click, stop in the store and pick it up. We want to make sure that the product is available to them however, wherever they want it. In the old days, validation was being the first one to wear that AJ4 or the Hyper Adapt. That was the validation you needed. Not any longer. Today, what happens? I walk into stores all the time. I see consumers, our consumers, once you're on their right foot, once you're on their left foot, taking a selfie and posting it out to Instagram, getting feedback from their followers and saying, buy the one on the right, buy the one on the left. And that's how they make their buying decisions. That's how they get some of their validation. Then they move on and they start the circle all over again. 
and it's constant. So one of the things as an industry we have to figure out is how we go from seed to scale much quicker. You know, the journey is fast. You know, this, this slide sort of depicts that, right? In the gray, you can see a traditional curve of how product used to seed, scale, mature, and then we'd see the decline. You know, with our consumers' instant access to information, they want it, they want it now, and then they're on to the next. You know, I think the, the, the truth is we don't necessarily sell fewer shoes. We just have a much more compressed time period in which to draw their interest, pique their interest, and move on. That doesn't necessarily work in the old futures model that the athletic side of the industry works on. We've got to figure out how to create shoes, how to build excitement, how to bring things to market quicker. You know, certainly there's faster ways to get product from China to the U.S., but printing shoes in the store, think about that. Manufacturing shoes closer to the, the consumer. For us, the supply chain of putting products closer to the consumer, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. But it really is a, a, a huge opportunity for us as an industry to look at this life cycle, look at how the consumer is consuming that product, and react to it. The old days of, of trying to guess six, seven, eight months in advance what this consumer is going to want six, seven, eight months from now, they don't know what they wanted for breakfast this morning and they already ate it, right? That's just the way this consumer thinks. They move, move, move. And we as an industry have to move with them. So we at Foot Locker are really recalibrating. You know, the strategies have to be built to adapt to the change. Obviously, it's easy to talk about. It's a little bit trite to say, but, you know, the consumer's got to be at the center of it. And the connectivity with the consumer has to be an all-time high. You have to be digitally focused, digitally led, mobile enabled. We have to build communities. Right? You're going to hear this afternoon from some folks that have really figured out how to build communities around sneakers. The Pencil team has done a great job of creating energy and excitement around sneakers. It's fantastic to see it happen. And then we, with 3,000 stores, multiple digital and social applications, have to figure out how to create a retail experience that's more than just transactionally led. It's not the transaction. The transaction comes because you've built great community, because you've connected with the consumer, you've got engaging experiences. I'll talk about each of these in a little bit more depth. <coughs> it always starts with the consumer, and as I said, it's really trite to say, and far more difficult to do, but the consumer has to be at the center of everything that we do. You know, and this consumer is always connected, right? They wake up, the device goes on. I'm not sure they ever go to sleep. Right? I mean, it's just the, the device is constantly doing their work for them. It's, it's helping them sort out what's cool today. You know, they've got all of the right things coming to them first thing in the morning, and then they live on the device throughout the day. So we really think about, the, you know, with the consumer at the center of everything, what's our consumer telling us? And this slide sort of tells you what's going on with our consumer. Social Everything that's going on in the world is their influence for it. It's not just the athlete. It's the athlete as a father. It's the athlete off the court. It's the musician. You know, I think the NBA has probably done as good a job as anybody of sort of mixing sport, lifestyle, social things all up in one, and, and that becomes a great influence for our kid. They've got tremendously high expectations. They really do obsess over what's new. You know, as I said, they see themselves as a brand. They want to be the first to post a photo of something. One thing that's undeniable is they have a tremendous love of sneakers. Their passion for sneakers might be as deep as Matt's. You know, they love it. They want new, they want fresh. New and fresh doesn't necessarily mean the hyper-adapt. It could be a retro launch that they haven't seen for a while. It could be an OG colorway of the Air Safari, my favorite shoe ever, 1987. Beautiful shoe. They just reissued it. Fantastic. Love the fact that it came back. But it's about creating an environment that our consumer can relish against these things. You know, we've talked about it. Our customers are mobile obsessed. They're social obsessed. 
influence and validation are critical to them. They want instant validation, instant gratification. They want to be able to get the product now. You know, they don't need it delivered to their trunk. They can stop by our store. And if we've got an environment that they want to pick it up in, it's a great shopping environment, great experiential, experiential environment. That's really going to be driven by customer data insights. The way that we move forward, you know, everybody's talking about data, big data, data scientists. You know, the, the sexiest job in the world today seems to be a data scientist. Right? But as my CIO always reminds me, data's dumb. Right? It's algorithms. It's the people that know how to understand. It's the ability for the machines to, to sort through and learn from the data that we collect. So part of what we have to do is harness the power of that data to be able to better serve our customers. You know, we have to obsess over our customer insights, the data points that we're able to collect. The more we know about the customer, the more likely we are going to be able to personalize our representation to that customer. You know, it's a funny business, right? You don't know that your best customer is in the store until they get to the cash register and they're ready to check out. The airlines are great. You know, I call a, a special number. They take care of me. They know my seat preferences. They know my food preferences. We've got to figure that out. And I'm going to talk about our new loyalty program in a minute, but that's the direction we're going towards. What we learn has to change our behaviors because it, it's, it's informed by the consumer behaviors. Again, this is a long journey. You know, we move at evolutionary speed, our customer moves at revolutionary speed, and we've got to be able to transform along the way. You know, I talked earlier that, that it really is about digital. We have to be digital-led, we have to be mobile-led, that's where our consumer lives. But they don't mind visiting physical spaces either. And that's really important. You know, we made an announcement that we were going to close 100 stores, you know, in our last earnings call. That was the headline. The retail apocalypse hits Foot Locker. 100 stores are going to close. We've closed 1,000 stores over the last 10 years. Our square footage has grown because we've built more exciting spaces. We've got a 200-door basketball specialty shop called House of Hoops. We're trying to create excitement for the consumer. The real headline wasn't that we're closing 100 doors. It's that we're going to open 40 and they're going to be really special places for our consumer to come and engage with our brand. That's the message. You have to be where the customer is. You have to be willing to invest digitally, certainly, absolutely. You have to be able to, willing to invest in data, absolutely. But you've got to be willing to create an omnipresent sort of culture. So we are committed to digital, you know, and, and I, as I opened, you know, and as Matt pointed out, we're a legacy retailer, right? Legacy retailer means legacy systems, you know, not necessarily built for this digital age that we live in. So we're making a big investment in some foundational upgrades, things that aren't very sexy, they're in the background, you don't see them, but they make it easier for our consumer. They're the foundation that we can build all of this great digital uh, connectivity through. And it really is work that has to be done. The sexier stuff is obviously over on the front-facing stuff, the consumer enhancements, building better apps, creating a better digital environment for them, creating more connectivity between the stores and our digital environment, all of those things. And you'll see those start to roll out over time. But it really is, uh, you know, we've been in the brick and mortar business for over 40 years. You know, we've been on this digital journey. As I said, we launched our first website in 1997. So we've been doing this for a while, and now getting the two connected is really important to us. You know, so the back of the house stuff will certainly be taken care of. The front of the house stuff will be taken care of. But one of the biggest investments we're making is data. You know, we're using data today to, to inform every decision that we make, from how we message consumers, how we merchandise our websites and our stores, you know, what product we buy, the level of service we need to provide to, to consumers, and ultimately the experience that they have. As I said before, data on its own is useless. It's building the algorithms. It's getting the machine learning in place so that we can learn faster and adapt to where the consumer preferences are. So we're going to continue to invest in all of those areas. 
And I think that it's critical that we think about data. You know, obviously, when you think about uh, you know the the personal information that we collect, uh, the the rollout of uh, GDPR, which is going to impact the euro uh, zone where we do business, but will also have a significant impact on the U.S. We all have to be very protective of that data. But at the same time, we have to use that data, and our consumers will provide plenty of data to us as long as they get a benefit out of providing that data. And that's sort of the quid pro quo that you have to think about. We're looking to upgrade all of our, our digital and mobile touch points, you know, from launch calendars to our apps to, to creating more connectivity and less friction when people come into the store, using a, an app to be able to unlock a locker inside our stores and pick their product up that they ordered and bought. You know, those are things that are in process and we'll be testing uh, starting uh, this fall in the UK and we'll, we'll also have a couple of tests here in the US. You know, it really creates this, this environment, this ecosystem where the consumer is totally in charge with this device but can interact with us across multiple touch points. As I talked about earlier, you know, part of this data collection and part of the quid pro quo is giving the consumer for something, giving the consumer something for the data that you're able to collect. So today we've got a buy banner loyalty program that's sort of discount driven and, and our consumer, you know, because we operate in the premium end of sneakers, our consumer is not really led by discounts. Our consumer is led by cool, our consumer is led by experiences, our consumer is led by engagement. So we're scrapping the old program. You know, we'll transition, obviously, to the new program over time, but uh, it's going to be an entirely new proposition. It's going to go across all of our banners so that a consumer is able to get points or earn points no matter where they happen to buy product or no matter where they choose to engage with us. It's going to be the rewards are going to be driven by engagement experiences, being able to go on a photo shoot that we do with some of the celebrities, some of the athletes that, that uh, cons consumers uh, use as influencers. We'll have new tiers so we'll be able to recognize our highest level customers sooner. And clearly it's about the benefits that you can provide to the consumer. Again, there's a lot of data that's going to be exchanged. The more we know about you, the better we can do in terms of personalizing the experience for you. So that's, that's really one of the things that's, that's most exciting. Probably in terms of benefit, Maybe one of the less exciting things, one of the less sexy things, is upgrading our POS. Oh, really? You have to do that? Yeah, we have to do that. You know, old legacy brick and mortar POS. You know, what we'll be able to do with this new POS system? It'll be much more dynamic. It'll be much more customer centric. You know, it will it will strengthen our associates in the stores, right? You know, today the the consumer comes in with this device and has literally more information available at their fingertips than our, our associates do. By using handheld devices on the floors of all of our stores and, and creating a better POS environment, we'll be able to be on par with the consumer. And we'll be able to capture a lot of the voice of our consumer, which is one of the things we have to do better. We have to be active listeners to our consumer. We have to figure out what's motivating them. When you hear that early warning sign, when you hear that early signal, you have to be ready to respond to it. Our new POS system will certainly help us do that. As I said, it's not quite as sexy as the other stuff, but it's, it's one of those foundational things that we have to do. You know, community is one of our, our core values. And we know that building community uh, interacting with the communities where we live and work is critical to this consumer today. It's critical to our employees. 40,000 employees across the, the globe want to connect and they want to build the community around them. You know, we used to be able to do a lot of this and now in the world of, of instant social media there's a hesitation because if something goes wrong the world knows about it immediately. Well, we have to be willing to take that risk and we have to connect with the communities. You know, so certainly we're, we're focused on capitalizing on our physical space. You know, through local content, local artists, you know, we're going to change the way that people think about stores. You know, we've talked about power stores and marketplace stores. Those are coming, right? We want it to be an entire experience. It might be a barber chair in the back of the store. It might be a sneaker cleaning service on every Thursday. You know, if you earn the right number of points in our loyalty program, bring your sneakers in on Thursday and get them cleaned. It's great business. We sell a ton of shoe cleaner. Why don't we bring that to our consumer? 
Is that a benefit our consumers want? Absolutely. They want nothing but the freshest sneakers. I don't know how Matt keeps his so white, because they just don't stay white that long. But he doesn't wear them that often, I guess, is the, the answer to that. But, you know, so again, building up community is really important to us. You, know, you have to do it at the localized level. You have to do it through data collection. right? And you can see a little highlight around Miami here. We've got a, a plan in Miami where we're, it's going to be one of the early markets that we test from this localized strategy. You know, it's going to be the right product assortment. It's going to be the right local marketing. It's going to be the right connection with the community. We're going to make the right financial investment. And we're going to have feet on the street. We're going to have boots on the ground. We're going to have people that are about activating and engaging with the consumer in that marketplace the way that they want to be engaged with. Again, not every market is treated the same. You know, all 3,000 stores won't suddenly be transformed. But a lot of the concepts that we learn in markets like Miami, in concepts through our, like our power stores, we'll be able to spread out across our entire platform. Retail experience, you know, I started to touch on this a little bit, but it, it really is driven by three principal pillars, right? We've got to have products and experiences and environments that are inspired and inspiring. Right? Our consumers have to be excited when they walk in the store. It's got to be connected to the local market. At the same time, it's got to be connected to the global sneaker market. You know, in the old days, it was great. Right? Things would launch in Europe, and they would slowly make their way to the East Coast. They would slowly make their way to the Midwest, and then you'd sell them out when they got to the West Coast. Or they'd start in Japan, and they'd come to the West Coast, make it to the Midwest, and you know, the, the opposite direction. Today. If Kanye wears something on stage in Tokyo tonight, our kids got it immediately, and they want it right now. So we have to figure that out. But creating that inspired and connected community is critical. And clearly, you have to make as, it be as seamless as possible. Right? A consumer understands that shopping and buying here is different than shopping and buying in a store, but you have to reduce every possible friction point along the way. One of the things I talked about earlier is getting product closer to market. For us, that means changing the way we think about our supply chain, using mini hubs so we can replenish stores on a more frequent basis, using mini hubs so that we can ship directly into key markets same day or next day. Right? We already have, theoretically, 3,000 supply chain points in our stores, but in order to leverage our inventory, utilizing a, a, a series of mini hubs around the country is certainly going to expedite our ability to take care of the consumer. So we'll test those, and, and they truly are set up to be omnichannel. We'll, we'll supply to consumers and consumers on the DTC side of the house, and we'll replenish stores much quicker. Part of this is about our associates as well. I talked about that earlier, but they are our advocates. They are our influencers. Right? They're our social connection with this consumer. So by elevating our associate engagement across service, their product knowledge, their brand knowledge, the loyalty program, mobile data, we're going to empower our associates to truly be that expert. They want to be that conversant, conversationalist when, when people come into the store. They want to be able to talk about the, the product. They want to know that Matt Priest is one of our best customers, and they want to be able to speak directly to him. We're going to develop local brand ambassadors. We've got a local influencer network that we're setting up. We've got brand energy events. Actually, it's not NRE, it's energy. Little typo there. And, and we're going to have local marketing and product support. Right? You have to get it down to the local level. There's still going to be great big broad launches, but you've got to be able to communicate with the consumer locally. So just to, to wrap up, I, I want you to know this is a revolution. But this is what we paid for. Chaos is good. You know, we can all thrive in chaos, but you've got to have a lot of energy. You've got to be willing to make the hard decisions, and you've got to be willing to go. When you're an old legacy retailer, you get evaluated differently than a guy that's a digital pure play. So we have to be aggressive. We have to be bold. We have to make important decisions. But we've done that simply by restating our, our mission statement to inspire and empower youth culture, that forces our organization to take a different track than we've been on before. We'll do it through highlighting data, 
being digitally led, connecting with our community, and most importantly, focused on the customer experience. We want to empower that customer each and every day. So with that, I know we left a couple minutes for questions. Thank you, and I'd be happy to address any questions you might have. Yeah, so there was the great Dick Johnson of Foot Locker, Andy. And you know what? He talked about being uh, having a dynamic business model, meeting the consumer where they are. He talked about ways in which they're exploring point of sale. So the point of sale is not behind a traditional cash register. It's where the, where the consumer is actually getting the shoes put into their hand before they walk out the door. He talked about building in p potential experiences like getting your shoes cleaned and, right. and just bringing people through, to providing reasons for folks to come back and product drop. So to me, again, he set the tone. Foot Locker's innovative, like the product that they sell. And uh, and so it was great to get his insight on where we're headed as an industry. Yeah, I mean, he basically was saying, you know, that for all, it's it's this whole narrative we keep hearing, retail is dead, brick and mortar is dead in that yeah. instance. And he's saying, it's just, it's reforming itself. It's right. not dead. It's just changing. The face of it is changing and how they interact with consumers are changing. And when you add in e-commerce, it can't be the same as it used to be because no. you because you will go away. But um, Foot Locker clearly has a vision, um, and they're working on to 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 implement that vision. And it continues to work, and they continue to have success, and they continue to work really well with the brands um, on launches and on on making sure that uh, the footwear the footwear consumers going to Foot Locker. Uh, are getting what they want. Um, and uh, it's a success story that can be replicated if people are willing to be a little bit bold and think a little bit differently and outside the box of what the future is going to hold and, and how they can, um, you know, connect with people in, in important, uh, important ways in a variety of ways, not just online, but, you know, face to face. Yeah. So I think it was, um, you know, it's a reconstitution of the footwear model. It's a reconstitution of the footwear retail model. And who better to kind of educate us on that than the than the good folks at Foot Locker. So that was awesome to have them. And it's just another way we're peeling back the layers, yep. Andy. Well, there's a lot of voices out there. A lot of companies are doing different things. Uh, there's no golden goose. Everybody does something differently, but it all works for them. Um, and our goal here on Shoein is merely to bring those voices to the masses to you listening out there and maybe you can glean a couple of things that can help your business and that is a success for us so um, we're here to help ameliorate the debate as Abraham Lincoln would say to raise the debate nice. you like that mm -hmm. love it um, folks uh, this is a shoe and show you can find us shoe and show.com uh, we're on Twitter on Facebook at shoe and show um, if you would like to be a guest or you have topics or ideas you would like us to discuss, you can hit us up on our contact form on our website. You can also subscribe to our podcast on iTunes or any other platforms for Google phones or Samsung phones. Um, until next time, I want to thank uh, Foot Locker for allowing us to, to put that out there. And uh, for Matt, I'm Andy and Shoein is out. Shoein has been brought to you by the FDRA the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion, helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.